Hey, this is Paul Feig, and you're listening to Fascination Street Podcast. This podcast is always good, never evil. Yeah! AV in your ears, the app was Feig, giving you this audio visual down the most interesting street in the world. With my boy Steve, Fascination Street, you already know. Let's get it when you whip in the Fascination Street. What do you- Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with Stephen Kunis. Stephen Kunis is a celebrated screenwriter of TV and film, and even wrote for four years on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. In this episode, we talk about how he got into writing for television and film, how he met Norman Lear and and how that changed his life. We talk a little bit about a couple of the shows that he wrote on. He has written on one of the top 50 worst shows of all time as per TV guide. And he has written on one of the best episodes of television in history. Also as judged by TV guide. So we talk about some of those things. We talk about some of the films he worked on, including the, one of the Harry Potter films, rain man, Castaway. It's all crazy, but then wait for it. Things take a turn. And Stephen explains why Wikipedia lists him first and foremost as an American con artist. So we talk all about that and also about what a bunch of dicks Wikipedia is and Stephen's new TV show called Over My Dead Body. It's available at OverMyDeadBody.tv. It's available on Amazon Prime. And you can get the audio only version of it as a podcast called Over My Dead Body. And I'm not even going to tell you what the premise of that show is, because I think you're going to dig it. And this is my conversation with screenwriter for television and film and former con man, Stephen Kunis. Prepare to be fascinated. Prepare to be fascinated. Prepare to be fascinated. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Stephen Kunis. How you doing today, man? I am doing just great. That is fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Stephen Kunis. He is a screenwriter of almost everything you've ever seen. If it's a movie that you love, he worked on it. If it's a TV show you love, he worked on it. If it's a TV show you hated, he might have worked on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stephen, what I like to do is I like to help the guests understand how the guests got to be who they were by starting where they started, man. Where were you born and raised? Where'd you grow up? I was born in Levittown, Pennsylvania, which is a very, a, a really a quintessential prototype for the suburbs. It was actually uh, what the TV show, The Wonder Years, was based on. Just the perfect little cookie cutter homes. Guys would come back from the war and their girlfriends would hopefully still be waiting for them and they would get married and have 100 kids and go to the garden center and plant their lawn. And a very uneventful but wonderful childhood. It's amazing to me how so many people out of Levittown, like Billy Joel was one of them, you know, went on to careers in the entertainment industry. I got out of high school back in 1974. I'm 66 years old. I decided that I was going to go to the big city. I was going to go to L.A. And then I figured, well, I looked at the map and New York was closer. So I went to NYU. I was practical. I studied comparative literature because that's something that would definitely get me a job. Now, I always tell people if I didn't become a writer, I would have no tangible skills. <laughs> but I had a great time in New York. I started submitting. When you're young, you just think that stuff will happen. You don't think of the odds against you. So I just started like mailing things out blind to, let's say, the New Yorker, <laughs> you know, uh, or, or or Playboy back then, uh, New York Magazine. And because I I didn't think of the odds, it's like a little kid riding a bike. They don't practice this. I'll just ride a bike. I can do it. Uh, I had a few things accepted when I was 20 years old. And uh, I started writing articles for magazines while I was in college. And, and then Shortly after college, I had the crazy idea to make a list of the people that I respected most in television, because that's what I wanted to do is write for television and write them letters. So I wrote a letter to Aaron Spelling. I wrote a letter to Norman Lear. Now, how crazy is that? Norman Lear answered my letter on March 16th, 1983. I, I, at 3 p.m., I got a letter from my uh, mailbox. 
in my mailbox. It was a Wednesday. And he said he would like to read something that I had written. So what did you say in this letter? This is the great secret to making it in show business. And I don't think enough people realize that. Write a a one-page letter. Don't just write to everybody. Choose people that you really uh, respect the most and tell them why. And that is what I said in the first paragraph. I said, you're you're exactly the person. The the work that you do is exactly what I want to do with my life. And I just got out of NYU, you know, graduated from NYU. You know, I've been writing for some magazines and I'm thinking about moving to California. And I, in fact, I've decided to do that. But I thought I would write to you first because, you know, I'm either going to write to you from here or I'm going to write to you when I get there. But you're the person, that, you know, and, and he responded to that. And, he you know, Norman Lear. And he's uh, he's been a friend of mine now for 41 years and he's 100 years old. He's still alive and kicking. And uh, I guess it's like writing to the president, you know, of Ford Motors, if if you want your brakes fixed. <laughs> what, you know, who, who would be crazy enough to do that? But then I came, I came to find out that they had done the same thing. Norman Lear wrote a letter to Sid Caesar in the 1940s. So what made you decide that, that you should do that? What gave you that idea? I had a friend named uh, Ted, Ted who had written a letter to like the, the chairman of Hyatt for some reason. I forget why it was. And the guy answered his letter. I thought, Nobody ever thinks that the person at the top will even see what you write. And the fact is, nobody writes to them because they just assume that. In fact, I ended up years later writing an episode of a TV show where the guy wants to do well in his company. So he invites the head of the company to dinner. They said, who, why would you, he's never going to come. It turns out nobody ever invites the guy. They're too scared to talk to him. You know, so he comes to dinner and, you know, whatever, but. Comedy ensues. That's what happened. And in my case, uh, they thought they poisoned the guy with the, with the meal they made for him and they had to have his stomach pumped and then it turned, you know, whatever. So uh, comedy did ensue. (laughs) <laughs> but but that's how I got uh, my break in television was writing a letter to the person I most respected. And he hired me as an apprentice comedy writer. I wasn't the only one. He had hired four people that year. He put us together with seasoned writers that were decades older. And we learned from them. It was really on the job training, I think. What was the plan? Like, I know that, you know, like you said, you grew up in a blue collar town. What did your parents want you to be? Or did they have any suggestions for you? A lawyer was a good suggestion. My uncle uh, was an attorney and he said, you'd make a great lawyer. You have good writing skills and you seem personable. I actually had applied to some law schools. I got into a law school and I just decided I didn't feel like doing that. Maybe I made a mistake. I don't know. But I would say I wanted to become a television writer. I would get the same response from people like, that's that's ridiculous. And I would always look at the credits and I would say, see all this, this list of people. These are the people that worked on the show. They probably came from all over the country and they saw people's names the same way I'm doing. And I, I said, they all exist. Obviously, somebody makes this stuff. And when I ended up getting out to California, I would meet some of the people and I recognized their names because I used to study the credits on all the shows. That's what gave me the idea and and built my confidence that, you know, other people do it. Maybe it's more prevalent now, but back when I started, people really just thought that's a a ridiculous dream. That's not not a realistic dream. One of the things that I like to ask is what made people think they could do something? Where did you get the confidence that even though everybody around you was saying, that is a ridiculous pipe dream, Stephen. Where did you get the, the confidence, I guess, in the, the drive? Like, how did you know you could be a, a writer? My 11th grade English teacher, her name was Christine Beck, and I still keep in touch with her all these years later. She used to give me five minutes at the end of the English class if I would shut up during the class. She'd say, okay, you can talk. And she, she said, I'm going to end up watching something with your name on it. Oh. And I've kept in touch with her for 50 years. Uh, I had a professor in NYU, uh, Sidney Offit. I still keep in touch with him. He's 95. One day I made up a bunch of jokes, like one-liners. And he said to me, you know, these aren't all great. He goes, but like 10 of them are pretty good. He goes, what, what amazes me 
he said, is how fast you came up with all of them. He, he said, you really, you really should consider. And here I am, you know, thinking maybe I'll be a, like a serious novelist. And he said, you really should consider writing for television. You, you have a knack for this. He was very supportive, and so were other professors. At, so it was really my professors. I had an English teacher, and and a few professors at NYU, and a high school English teacher, and then eventually my mom came around, and, and she. She would like clip articles like here's a guy that just got a job right from Buffalo. He, you know, that kind of thing. But generally, we find our families in what we do. So when I got out there, there's like a whole bunch of us that came from all over the place whose parents said that they should become a doctor. I love it. So Norman Lear gave you your big break. What was the first thing you worked on for Norman Lear? Well, if you started the podcast by talking about some of the worst things on TV. I did a show called AKA Pablo starring Paul Rodriguez, which was about a Mexican American family. And the guy, the kid's a young guy, he's a stand up comedian, his life and the people in his family. And according to TV Guide, this is a 1984, uh, TV Guide ranked it number 45 out of their worst 50 shows in the history of television. It got canceled after six episodes. Mine was the second episode. Actually, the ratings weren't that bad, but it was a fantastic flop. <laughs> and the next year, I wrote an episode. I almost didn't want to do it because I thought the show was silly of uh, The Love Boat. And it turned out that they made it the 200th episode of the show. According to TV Guide, they have it rated at that episode as number two out of the 100 greatest episodes of all time. So within one year, I went, I, I made two lists, the worst of all time and the best of all time. And I don't think the love boat really deserved to be in there. I think Aaron Spelling must have known someone at TV Guide. But I was going to say, so what was it like to, you know, in your second show or whatever, get to work with one of the other guys you wrote a letter to? What was it like to get to work for Aaron Spelling? Well, Aaron had never responded to my letter by I had an agent that sent me and he said you know the love boat's looking for a 200th episode and they just want a story with an all-star cast so come up with some idea that would you know you'd have like a hundred people so I came up with an idea that somebody hid a treasure on the boat not a brilliant idea but he loved it and he had Cloris Leachman and Andy Griffith and Milton Berle and Tom Bosley and a hundred more people and what happened was when I got into the office I t and I saw Aaron Spelling, I said, you know, I wrote you a letter a couple of years ago. And he says, oh, they don't really give me the, you know, I said, I told him what it said. And I said, I wrote one to Norman. I, I told him the whole story. And uh, he said, well, I'm, I, I, sh I wish I had answered your letter because we really like your script. And, uh, and, you know, they're in the middle of shooting. Andy Warhol was in that episode, believe it or not. I think maybe that's why it made the list because it was so odd. <laughs> Maybe because it was so star-studded. I well, that's what he wanted to do. It was the last season of the show, and he wanted to go out with a bang, I guess. So Lucille Ball was supposed to be in it, but she got sick apparently the week before. So I told everybody, Lucy, Lucy's going to be in my show, and then they thought I was lying when <laughs> she didn't do it. I kind of bounced around. That, that's what people do. Once you get in, it's like you're not in. It's like that you have to fight. You have to stay in. It's not something like, oh, Norman Lear hired me and I, I worked for him for a year and a half until he, he sold his company. It's not like you sit back and go, well, look, I'll just pick up the phone and call. There's like 10,000 people that are working out, out there. It's not, you know, there's, I think there's almost 20,000 in the Writers Guild and, and 12,000 are working more current anyway in their membership. So they're probably working mo mostly. It's like you're always knocking on a door. You're always, hoping the show doesn't get canceled. It's not, it, it's not an easy life, but it's a lot of fun. I, I find it. A friend of mine is a, a TV writer and he is always hoping that the show gets canceled in the second season. Cause after working a full one season, he can't take it. He's like, yeah, I don't like any of these people. <laughs> well, he, he's, he's right. I know what he's saying. Yeah. That's pretty funny. So you get your start with Norman Lear. He sells his company. And then what happens? You're just sitting there knocking on doors again. You're writing letters again. Uh, no, I, at that point, I, I was, 
I was doing okay. Uh, people were still were seeking me out at that point. Like for, I would say for about the first 10 years. Oh, wow. You know, as you approach 40, you know, they, the Writers Guild has a committee. It's called, they've had it forever, called the Over 40 Committee. They, they still have it. And because once you're 40, it's almost as if somehow a secret message got sent to every producer in town. I said, this guy's a 40. Your offers really dry up. And I was told that uh, once by Brandon Tartikoff, who used to run NBC, he said, well, the optimum audience is 18 to 35. And so the, the logic is that the people who are that in that age range can best write for that age range. And I said, but a lot of them can't really write. You know, you have to have some experience. And he said, well, they're the ones that spend the money. And I, I told him, I said, they don't have any money. It's the only people that have the money are like they're over 50. 22-year-old person doesn't have, and he said, well, they have enough. That, I, that was his thing. So uh, I worked on Kate and Alley. I worked on Cheers. I worked on the Tonight. Okay, let's take Kate and Alley for a second. So Brandon is saying, hey, you know what? You're over 40. You can't write in the voice of a younger person or whatever. But yet they'll hire you to write in the voice of a show that is basically just two women. You can write for women, but you can't write for young people. <laughs> that, is, that is an ex excellent point. And in fact, the show, Kate and Allie, was created by Sherry Coben, a woman. And they ended up firing her off her own show because they said that, from what I was told, what she told me, she said they, they thought that a woman can't write comedy. How, like, well, she created the show. Like, obviously, she can write comedy. Also, most of the roles for women are written by men. You're you're right, and and so it's what a man thinks the woman would say. It's it's very ironic, but I had a I had a great time writing for Kate and Allie, and they they liked me, and I really focused on the story. Whether I I think the the stories that I wrote I think could have been if it was two guys or two women, it would have been the same. That's the way I approached it. Sure. Of course, my plots didn't have anything to do with issues involving women. I, I had one where Kate gets invited to the ballet and it's called Dress to Kill. She she buys a dress. You know, she doesn't have enough money for this dress that she wants. And her, apparently she has a friend that charged up a dress and she returned it the next day, said she didn't like it. So she figures she's going to do that and get away with it. And of course, at the ballet, she gets the dress, like gets a stain on the dress has to go to a dry cleaner. He gets it out. She picks it up. You know, it was given to the wrong guy, Callahan, down the street. And how could that be? She goes down the street. Uh, Callahan's is a funeral home. Guess where the dress is? So Kate, Kate has to get the dress off a dead woman and return it to Bergdorf Goodman's. I think I would have been a good writer for Lucy. Yeah, I think so. That sounds very Lucy Ball. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what I did at Kate and Allie. I wrote little adventures that they could get into. So throw out some more of those show names. You mentioned Kate and Allie, Cheers. What else? Cheers, Family Ties. I worked on a lot of, I call them one and done, where you, you work on a new show and it only lasts like stir crazy. They did an, that was a movie with Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder. And they actually did a TV version for CBS. So I did a lot of the first episodes of shows and then they didn't pick them up that kind of thing. I also did rewrites on a number of films uh, or adding a couple of scenes, um, that kind of, kind of thing. A lot of people don't know, but if you see a, one or two names in a movie, it probably has 10 writers that were assigned to it over the course of its development. Sure. And so I did that. It's a nice, I think, creative life. And in the old days, there were three networks even before Fox came along. I can never thought I would live long enough to say in the old days, but there were three hours a night of prime time. So 20, 21 hours a week for each network. Some, a lot of that was sports. Right. So really, you know, from eight to nine, you had comedies, nine to 10, sometimes comedy, sometimes drama. And 10 was always a drama. I could name the entire prime time schedule off the top of my head for all three networks. Now I can't even name all the networks. Right. I mean, there must be 500 different places to watch something. And I think the opportunities now for people to write of all ages, forget 
everything I said about over 40 that was true is no is no longer true. There's there's never been a better time to pursue a career in writing for television or with with all the streaming services. So if anybody listening has an idea and thinks that uh, they're dreaming or it's a pipe dream or they're unrealistic, that's not that's not the case anymore. So at a certain point, you started working on movies. You worked on, oh, I don't know, just to name a couple that nobody's ever heard of. You worked on, I think it was the first Harry Potter film. The second one, yeah. Oh, it was the second right. one. You worked on the second Harry Potter film. You worked on Castaway, right? Uh, with what's his name in that movie that nobody ever saw, and then, uh, <laughs> and then you also worked on, I think, another Academy Award winner, Rain Man. Yeah, that was the only Academy Award winner. Castaway didn't. Win. Castaway didn't win anything. No, no, he didn't win. They should have given an award to Wilson. I think everybody asked me. They go, "Did you write the Wilson part?" And I did not. So that's why they're more interested in a volleyball. Isn't that hilarious? Than, than, I mean, they yeah. sold the shit out of volleyballs with a handprint on them after that movie. Right. Right. How big of a part did you play in helping bring the second Harry Potter film to life? It was actually the fifth uh, Harry Potter and the half blood prince was, was number five. Number five. Okay. Sorry. Not much. Steve Clovis wrote all of the Harry Potters. Except for that one, he had quit Harry Potter, so they they brought in a, a few writers, and that's the, that's the only reason that I was able to get get into that. Then he came back to finish them up. I I still to this day don't know why he didn't do that. I think he couldn't get his front door open to leave the house because of all the piles of cash that were in the way. That that's probably it. <laughs> he did the fa- uh, one of my favorite movies called The Fabulous Baker Boys, and then he started with harry potter and i think he just thought gee i'm gonna do this the next like 15 years but a lot of people don't know harry potter that all those movies were shot back to back because they didn't want the kids to grow up so they could they couldn't make a movie every two years that the kid would be like 25 years old by the time so they were shot and then the studio would hold them and you know release them you know every 18 months every two years that that sort of thing that is so wild. Rain Man had a real interesting development story. Uh, Barry Morrow wrote the first script, and the character Raymond was not autistic in that. That was changed. We, Ron Bass came in. I came in. Mary Schiskel came in. Uh, Elaine May came in. Like from Nichols and May? From Nichols and May. David Ward came in. There were 11 writers on Rain Man. Variety at one point had done a whole article on all of them. Steven Spielberg was going to direct Rain Man. I told everybody, hey, I'm doing a thing, Spielberg. And after about four months, he quit. He said, you know, this is good for like 20 minutes and people are going to get tired. The guy's autistic. Like nobody's going to want to watch that. So he quits Rain Man. And then Sidney Pollack came on. And same thing after a while. He goes, I love this. But now all of a sudden, I think it's, I don't know. And he quits. And then a guy named Martin Brest, who had done 48 hours, he quit. So everybody quit Rain Man. It was dead. Nobody wanted to do Rain Man. Then the Writers Guild strike hit, and they didn't have anything to really shoot. And the budget was slashed. And they said, well, let's just shoot this thing. If we can do it cheap enough, we'll we'll make our money back. And it ends up winning like the Academy Award. And you know, it's a classic film. It's amazing. It makes me wonder how many movies just n- never got made. Isn't that crazy? But to this day, people don't know Steven Spielberg quit Rain Man. Well, they will now. Yeah, well, now they do. At some point, I'm sure we're jumping around a little bit here uh, chronologically, but at some point, you worked for Johnny Carson's Tonight Show. Is that right? I did that toward the end of the show. How did that come about? My agent actually had contacted a former writer on the show. And he said, what does it take to get in to get it? He said, just write something um, that day. Don't just come up with jokes, write something that day to to demonstrate that you can on on a very short notice that you can write some jokes that can be used that night. And so I started circling things in the LA times. I came up with, I don't know, a dozen, a dozen jokes. And I showed them to my, he goes, well, okay. So 
come up with some. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go over to NBC. He said, come up with some Tuesday morning. He said, I'll swing by your place and I'll say, he just wrote these this morning and I'll give give it to him and see. He says, and by the way, they're not looking for writers. They, they have a lot of people that submit stuff to the show. And a lot of them are kids from Harvard Lampoon. And he's had used the same writers for years and, and hates change. And I said, well, thanks for telling me that after, after like, okay, now I'm going to write these jokes that are, I'm totally wasting my time. No pressure. And I did. And uh, he said, they, they want you to come in. I came in and I goes, yeah, I wonder who I'm going to meet with. Guess who I met with? Wait, let me guess. Let me guess. Pablo from AKA Pablo. No, didn't meet with him. I met with Johnny Carson. I met Johnny with, Carson. I met with uh, Ray Siller, who the head writer, and I met with Fred de Cordova, Peter Lissett, like the whole staff. Wow. And I go, okay. And they, they hire people in 13 week cycles. So I got hired for 13 weeks. So let's try that out. And that worked out. And then I went from another 13 weeks. I think I did like half a dozen of these cycles. It's a terrible way to live. Like thinking that every 13 weeks, you're going to be out of a job. But eventually it goes up to 26 weeks. Finally, it went up to a year. But some of the people that were, that were there for like 19 years. How long were you there? All, about four, almost four. Wow. Uh, that's the one job that I miss to this day. Why? Because it's a, it's immediate. Like you're you feel like you're getting paid to watch the news, and that night, if he, if he selects your joke, uh, and you don't know until you unless you're in the studio, you don't know what's going to happen. And then a lot of times you'll get they'll quote you the next day in the in the press. They'll say like, oh, here's what he said last night, and I go, oh, I wrote that. It's it's very it's it's immediate gratification if you write from. A scene in a movie, like maybe they'll shoot the movie in three years and they'll use your scene. Television's better. You write an episode of a show within three to seven weeks, it's on the air. The thing is, it's it's frustrating to write and not see your work published or produced. It's, it's an odd thing with a, the talk show and with the monologue. That's like that. Liter and he didn't want anything that was written a week before. David Letterman, Jay Leno would take jokes and hold on to them for a week. Carson would never do that. He said, I want everything written just that day. And he would have a pile of the stuff. He'd circle the ones he'd want. He'd put them in the order. They put them on cue cards back then. And he'd go over it, probably spend about a half an hour. That's, believe it or not. And he had this little system. That was the monologue. Those had to be some magical years working uh, for Johnny Carson. I, I can't even imagine the the plethora of people who came through that show just in the four years that you were there. Hey, Streetwalkers, here's a word from our sponsors. Let's get back into it. We are going to switch gears just a little bit because at some point, the wheels fall off the bus. Yes, they did. And what I mean by that, folks, is if you look up Stephen Kunis, the first thing it says is American con artist. Right. Right. I'm quoting Wikipedia when I say Stephen Kunis is an American con man and former screenwriter. He has been convicted of felony commercial burglary and grand theft by false pretenses. What happened, Stephen? Well, what happened to me was I got divorced. I ended up in a child custody battle. It wiped me out completely. I lost my house. I became chronically unemployed. I started drinking way to excess. I was living in Malibu at the time. I needed like 14,000 bucks. My credit was shot. And I had a bright idea. I would take checks from my old account one of my old closed accounts, but I still had the check checkbooks, put them in my new account and play stupid. And, and here's my, I get this asked ask this all the time. What were you thinking? I was thinking I would pay my bills and have enough money until I got the next job. Maybe that would be a few weeks. And if the bank asked, I, I'd say, oh my God, I mean, what a mistake. I had no idea because I had a good banking relationship uh, up until then. What I didn't know is that aside from being illegal, that they are required to file a police report. I believe it's called floating checks. Yeah, there was another word they used. 
Kiting was the Kite, right, but but it was to myself, right? You know, and so what happened was I got charged with that. I was put on house arrest for a felony conviction. You got put on house arrest. Well, because it's nonviolent. Okay. So I'm on house arrest, and they give me this ankle monitor that you have to wear to prove you're in your house. And like half the people take the monitors off. And I got involved with this woman. And she said, if you don't come over here right now, it was, that's not what she said. But I, I thought I was going to lose her. And I said to my lawyer, what happens if I take this monitor off? He said, well, the first time he said, probably nothing. But the worst thing that can happen is you would have to actually go to the county jail and do your time there. So he said, you're, you're really, you know, rolling the dice. So I roll the dice. And uh, I ended up with door number two. They not only put me in jail, they charged me with escape because that's considered an escape. And they sent me uh, for 115 days to Wasco State Prison. Where is that? In California, north of L.A. Okay. I turned home detention into prison. Good job, man. I I did a, a great job. My whole thing, here's the other part of it. I wasn't honest with anybody, even people close to me, about being unemployed because I thought that that would harm me as far as uh, future work. So I had this whole facade going that everything was great. So because I'm a a writer, I I was like all over the papers. So, So now it's like so much for the facade, too. So I'm going like, well, nobody's ever. I'm done. I'm just washed up. I'm a loser. I'm a total. My lawyer said, why don't you just tell them you're on drugs? You'll get a rehab program. I said, because I don't do like I I have to like make up a story that I'm a drug addict so that I can go instead of go. I, I go, that's like that's like even worse. He goes, no, but it's socially acceptable now. Everybody's on drugs. Just say, you know, you're a victim of your addiction and you, and you can sue like uh, some company and. and you know, play. I, 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 I don't think I can pull that off. So I find I find myself at an advanced age, with no money. Really, my my credit was getting a little better. Really, with nothing. And I talked to Norman Lear. I ended up getting in touch with him, and he told me a story. This is about ten years ago. Uh, he said that when he was nine years old, his father got arrested for fraud and put in prison for four years. And between the age of nine and 13, he and his mom moved in with his grandparents. Uh, They had to sell their furniture. They had to physically leave town because they were so embarrassed. He is from Connecticut. And he said he has never told anybody in his life until about five years ago, he wrote a book and he did include it. Finally, he's kind of lived with that. He said, you should have just come to me. I would have helped, which made me feel even worse. It was like, oh, my God. Like, And I think that changed things for me like as far as wikipedia uh there's a little if you see there's a little padlock on that and if you read the talk page they kept taking away all my credits and they just wanted to put my my wrongdoing in there so wikipedia locked the account and they said they would fix it this was over a year ago so you you can't do anything to this kind of like a frozen thing yeah because it it basically doesn't have Really, any of your nothing work on here? That's insane. So anyway, th- I'm jumping around a little bit, but back to Norman. Sure. So by telling me that, it really changed the way that I think. He said, "We're not going to be around forever, and you know, do the best you can. Don't worry about what any anybody thinks." He goes, "Half the people that, or most of the people that were in the business when you started, aren't even in the business anymore." You know, at that point. I thought of something that we talked about on the Tonight Show, and we had, we kept a fantasy wish list. Who would you like to see interviewed on the show, whether they're dead or alive? Napoleon, the Queen of England, whatever. And I came up with this show called Over My Dead Body, where you... Uh, how long ago did you come up with this show? 2015. Okay. Yeah. So where we interview uh, famous dead people... But we never mention they're dead. We go around the world to the cemeteries and plug a mic into the headstone. And we, you know, we ask them about what they're what what are they working on now? What's their take on current events? And we've done like Richard Nixon, Steve Jobs, Mark Twain, Phyllis Diller, Tupac Shakur, you know, Howard Cosell. Because of that show, 
uh, which is on Amazon, I was asked to do a TED Talk. Because of Over My Dead Body? Because of that show. Yeah, they wanted to uh, talk about education and entertainment. And, and since we do historical figures and make them entertaining, could I come up with something for that? And I said, I, this is before the pandemic, I said, I would love to, but have you really investigated me? Have you looked into to anything about me? And I don't know what. I said, well, I think you should. <laughs> I think you should. You might not want me. And so they found out that I had been and gotten myself in all that trouble. And they wanted me more. <laughs> they said, just include this, too. And I'm going, include this, too. So I go, what am I going to say? So I did a TED Talk called Square One at 60. It was about everything we're talking about, except condensed into 14 minutes and 10 seconds. I was scared to do the talk. And once it was done, even though it got a lot of good response, a great response, I was too afraid to put it on my own Facebook page. I thought all my friends would unfriend me. And finally, if my buddy David, uh, his name is Dave Kirkpatrick, who used to be the president of Paramount Pictures, a very good friend of mine, he put it on his page and somehow he tagged me. So it showed up on mine. And I got just overwhelming a positive response for just being authentic and just saying, here's what I did. And here's what I like. I don't know. I'm, you know, I don't blame anybody, but I talked about my show. I talked about the definition of square one, uh, which is really what it was about, and my mistakes, uh, some successes. Yeah, I was just thinking, even yesterday, how sad is it that like you could do a TED talk and be too afraid to put it on your and tell anybody about it? Like that would be like, oh, I just won an Emmy Award, but but keep it a secret. Yeah, yeah, that's like that's not normal. That's how I, you know, how I'm, I'm, how embarrassed I have have been about that. For some, I don't know. I guess Robert Downey's not embarrassed. He did three years in prison. I don't know. Maybe he is embarrassed. I can't imagine he's embarrassed. I think it would be like, hey, where do you keep your Academy Award? Are you kidding? I keep it under the bathroom sink. I can't let people see that. Yeah, that's right. So I mean, but that is the thing. I didn't announce that TED Talk for about eight months. And if I, in fact, I didn't ever announce that he put it there. And I, oh, my God. I remember, I remember thinking that, oh, my God, now everybody's going to know. And I'm going, what a kind of what a, good. That's like a good thing. A TED. But what I've come to find, and it took me decades to do it, is that the single thing people most appreciate is authenticity. They don't care who you are. They just want to know that you're being real with them. And I, I would say that for all of us, there's something about a person that's authentic. You don't have to tell everybody like every bad thing that ever happened. You don't have to disclose, but you don't want to be that, or I don't want to be that type of person where people say, wow, he just said that. That's like so unlike him. Do you ever meet somebody that they say, you go like, wow, that came out of left field. That's not the person I know. That, that means they've been fooling you. Right. Like guy's perfectly normal, and then he like becomes a mass murderer. They go, "Whoa, I'm, I'm, that's I, I didn't see that." Yeah, exactly. They always say, you know, he, he was a nice guy, he kept to himself. When you, he was a quiet man. But that's my thing now, just to do work that I enjoy, and uh, help people if I can. I always tell them, I, I get the number one. How do I get into TV or movies? I say, well, it's very difficult anyway. Why make it more difficult than it is by staying in your hometown? You have to go. If you want to be on Broadway, you have to be at Broadway. If you want to make it in Hollywood, you have to be. That's where you're going to meet people. That's where you're going to be able to get hired. You know, the only difference is if you do what you're doing, right, with the podcast, you can do that anywhere in the world thanks to these platforms. And, and people are people. You even see people now on television regulars on tv shows and they're essentially doing it from their their own homes in a little studio with a little robotic 4k camera it's pretty crazy it, it is uh, i mean howard stern uh has the studio in his home uh rush limbaugh worked out of his home forever the old days of going into the big the big studio were gone unless you're doing you know a, a television show sure so steven i gotta ask what was it like to start over at 60? And by start over, we're talking about building your career back in your name, right? What was it? It was kind of a relief, actually. 
on my 60th birthday, which was how I start my TED talk, I really didn't care if I died. You know, I, I wasn't suicidal or anything, but I, I just go, God, I like, I've really made a mess of my life. You know, it's like I just was dwelling on it. And I was with a friend and he said, well, you've done all these things. I go, well, then why am I sitting here with nothing? That's when I contacted actually Norman. He said, what do you, what is the thing you most want to do? I said, I'd like to do this talk show. I said, well, why don't you just do it? I go, how am I, how am I, I said, just do the pilot. And I did the pilot. And then, then we did more episodes. We shot it in Hollywood. We shot it in New York. And I really think that that gave me my sense of place in the world. I also had a play produced in New York. I, you know what it was? I, I wasn't trying to make money. I wasn't trying to gain fame. Nobody cares. You know, I just thought nobody cares what I do. Nobody cares what anybody does. I'm doing this show. And my 30-year-old DP says, who's Mae West? You know, I have my camera crew going. I never heard of Jack Benny, Milton Berle, Jackie Gleason, Jimmy Durante, Phyllis Diller, Tallulah Bankhead, like you name the history of Hollywood. And I'm going like, why am I worried about what anybody thinks? They're not going to, they don't remember Mae West. They're not going to remember me. Nobody, I, I go, wow, this life is fleeting. And that's when I injected the education into my episodes. I go, oh my God, I did this whole show assuming that the audience would know who the people are. Now I got to tell them who the people are. They know Richard Nixon and they know Steve Jobs. But they probably don't know Jimmy Stewart. They certainly don't know Walter Cronkite. I felt if you're going to work in television or movies, the least you should do is spend one week of your life reading a couple books. It's just kind of get an overview. The show is a comedy, but maybe it's a comedic way of teaching history. Because I always get, to, oh, my God, I had no idea that Mae West was the richest woman in America and saved Paramount from bankruptcy. Next to William Randolph Hearst, she was the, she was the most successful business person in America during a, a few year stretch. That's pretty outrageous, man. That is crazy. Yeah, but what was it like starting over? Uh, I shifted around in my mind what I had done. If I had gotten into this trouble when I was twenty two years old, that would be actually acceptable. Oh, he's young, he's stupid, and now look what he's done since. But because it happened later. It's like, oh, he's a failure. So I kind of just in my mind moved it around. I go, we're all a mixed bag. You know, we all have done dumb things. Maybe you didn't end up in jail. That's pretty dumb. But, you know, things that you wish hadn't happened. But if you stick it like Julia Child said, the same ingredients for a souffle, if you put them in a different order, it's a different dish. And she says, okay, so. You know, at the end of the day, you know, I did things I'm proud of. I did things I'm not proud of. If I could do it again and I was stuck having to make the same mistakes, I would have preferred to make them earlier. <laughs> but I kind of gave myself a break. I think people starting over at 50, and it seems to be a popular topic these days on podcasts, reinventing yourself, starting over. If you think of it as you're not starting over in the old linear sense, you're continuing. It really uh, buffers how you feel, but it's also a, a valid redefinition of, of, of it. Sure. I mean, I, you know, well, you say starting over, you get divorced, you lose your house, the whole thing. Then you go, well, I got to get back what I had. Well, and if that's the case, like you lost money in the stock market. Now you have 10 million bucks. Now you have nothing. And you don't, you feel like until you get the $10 million back that you're a loser. If you think of it as just, yeah, at one point in your life, you had, a, you know, you were doing very well. And this morning you had coffee and a bagel and that's fine. Otherwise, you're always trying to reclaim youth. Right. It's your losing battle there. So, like I said, it seems to be a popular topic starting over at, you know, what are you going to do when you're 60? And the thing is, you can now publish a, your own book through Amazon for free. You can put up your own podcast almost, I guess, for free if you want. And if you think to yourself, well, publishing your own book. Oh, who would do that? Well, Stephen King publishes his own books now. Fifty Shades of Grey, the one pub woman published it herself. You actually make more money. You get 70% royalty if you do publishing through Amazon versus 10% through a commercial publisher. That's wild. So there's plenty of opportunity for those people that might say, oh, I'm too old. I can't do that. Nobody wants me. They don't even ask you how old you are anymore, which is odd. 
It's crazy, right? I mean, it's amazing what people can do in their in their later years and call it a second career or a new chapter or whatever. Stephen, are you screenwriting again? Have you been screenwriting? Did you ever get back to screenwriting? Because the Wikipedia thing says former screenwriter. Well, what happened was it had said screenwriter, and then there's a kid on there, one of the editors that said, well, according to this article, he conned this guy out of money. And that's more recent. This was a few years back. So let's put him as a con man. And I contest, that's where I contested that. And that's why they locked the page. And, and there's really nobody you can call there. They don't, they have an office, but it's not, I don't know how it works. The only thing is, it's the first thing you'll ever see if you look me up. Sure. Because Wikipedia is always at the top. Right. The second thing, you'll see the TED talk. You know, why is that not mentioned, which I did a year and a half ago? Right. Anyway, I forgot your question. My question was, did you get back to screenwriting? Not really. Not not in the last, say, four years, because I've been consumed with this series. Gotcha. But I think I would like to. I have, an, I, I have a couple ideas. Well, tell everybody where they can find this series. Again, it's called Over My Dead Body. Yeah, so you can find it at overmydeadbody.tv. And there's a link to Amazon, if you have Amazon. And also the audio part of it, of each episode is stripped as a podcast. And you can just a link to the podcast, which is like, if you don't have a screen in front of you, you can listen to it. So overmydeadbody.tv. We've had you know, 29 million regular viewers. Oh, wow. So we're making more episodes. Our next episode is Jimmy Stewart. Oh, cool. The next one we're doing. I share a birthday with Jimmy. Wow. Okay. It's me and Cher. You and Cher and Jimmy Stewart, huh? Yeah, just the three of us. Nobody else was ever born on that. Do they say, I think Cher said that she shares a birthday with you. That's how I found out. Right. So how many episodes of this TV show of uh, Over My Dead Body are there so far? We have made 10 and we're making two more in the next month. The pandemic killed us. I'm sure. Two of the three studios we use shut down permanently. Right now, we're shooting it at the Comcast Center in Philadelphia, uh, but we're going to go back to Universal City probably later this year. Gotcha. So you release them just as you do them, right? So there's not it's not weekly or monthly. It's just as they're available. Yeah, we were hoping to do a bunch together, the, you know, the way they all go. I can never get used to saying the term drop. My my episode dropped, or I also I'm also not used to content. Yeah, we're dropping some content. That sounds ups- ridiculous to me. Well, Stephen, as we're heading out, tell people where they can find you on social media. On social media, Facebook uh, at uh, Stephen Kunis. I even have a blue check mark. How impressive is that? On what? On Facebook. Oh wow! I didn't even know they did that. It's like a public page. People we'll can you listen out. and write nasty things if you want. Oh, cool. I'm on uh, Instagram, Stephen Kunis. Uh, uh, social media, I'm kind of all over that, but I don't really use that to drive business you know, or anything. It's more more personal. I announce stuff for the show. You know, Most of it's just on the on the website for the show, the overmydeadbody.tv. Sure. But you can go to stephenkunis.com and find my TED Talk. You can find IMDb. You can find the Amazon link. That's probably the best thing. If, if, if you have no other website that you want to look at that day, remember when having a website was unique? Uh-huh. You go, oh, I got my own website. Now it's like the last thing the person wants to do is take your business card or go to your website. A lot of times I'll ask people if they have a website. And they just look at me like I'm crazy and they go, people still have those? <laughs> no, they do. If, if you're a member of the Writers Guild or the Authors sure. Guild, they offer them, you know, not it doesn't have to be extensive, but you put up a little biography. It's always written in the third person and they know the guy wrote it himself. Like, was, you know, uh, Mr. Kunis uh, first went out to California. Who's writing that? Exactly. You have that. You have some links to your books and things like that. Sure. I, I do have the simplest website I've ever come across. Oh, rad. Because I'm using Linktree. I decided, why have a website? Why not just like take and, and don't have a zillion links? Have five. So I have my resume. I have like IMDB, uh, my show, the TED Talk. I think that's pretty much it. There's just too much stuff out there. You know? Exactly. 
Well, Stephen Kunis, oh my goodness, you are a writing legend. You have written uh, on some of the most beloved and hated TV shows of all time. Right. You have written on some of the most amazing films of all time. And uh, I checked out a couple of episodes of Over My Dead Body, and it is awesome. It's super creative. Uh, I love that it exists. I highly recommend everybody check it out. I checked out Robert Kardashian, Nostradamus, and Steve Jobs. Right. They get progressively even funnier. It's like you're taking more risks, which I love. Everybody go check it out. Again, overmydeadbody.tv. Go check out stevekunis.com. Hell, find it on Amazon Prime. Oh, my gosh. Stephen Kunis. Before I let you go, is there anything that we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you about that you specifically wanted to talk about today? Did I miss anything? You got it all. You certainly uh, have done your homework, I think, more than anybody that I've ever uh, been interviewed by. <laughs> I've had a lot of interview requests. And, uh, you know, you you really do a great job on your show. I really, really appreciate that, man. Coming from someone as well-rounded and as well-versed as you, thank you so much. I mean, hell, you have an interview show, and you just told me that. So thank you. I appreciate that. That's right. Stephen Kunis, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your hectic interviewing dead people schedule to hang out and let us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street. I really appreciate it. Well, I, I really appreciate this. This has been a lot of fun. You are a lot of fun. And with that, dude, I think we're done. And you have a great rest of your week, man. I hope you're going to do some really cool, fun things. I will. I'm actually making a copy of my that Love Boat script. Oh, cool. I haven't had it for years. I lost it. I, I got connected to the producer who had hired me on Facebook, William Bickley. And he, he said, you know, I have a whole box of old scripts. Let me see if I can find the one you did. And he found it. Oh, that is so cool. It's a fact. Hold on one second. This is it. How cool is that? That's autographed by Cloris Leachman. Wow. That's super dope. Anyway. I only have one script. It's a script from the Andy Griffith show, and it was written by Ron Howard's dad. Wow. Rance. Is that his name? Rance? Yeah, Rance. I'm the last person to interview him before he passed. Oh, when was this? When did he pass away? I... He passed away in 2018, okay. I believe. Like uh, the Saturday after Thanksgiving. And I had interviewed him in July. I'm friends with Clint. Oh, okay. And so I went out there and I interviewed a bunch of people. It was when I was starting my show. And um, yeah, he was one of them. It was a great episode too. It was so much fun. Have you thought about going out to LA or? Like to stay, to live there? Yeah, to do your show out there or I don't know. No, like you said, I can do my show anywhere. Um, I have made, I think I've flown out to LA three times and I've interviewed a bunch of people each time that I was out there. I kind of set up a bunch of interviews. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, I've, yeah I've, so I've done that like three times, I think. And I've interviewed a bunch of different people in a bunch of different places. It's really fun. Ever interviewed anybody like me that had gotten into trouble? Yeah, I interviewed, um, he was the youngest, uh, see here, He, I think he was the youngest campaign manager or whatever. He he got in trouble for doing some weird sneaky politic thing, oh. and he went to prison for a while. And then when he got out, he wrote a couple of books and kind of got known for that. <laughs> You're so funny. Anybody like me who got in trouble? <laughs> I just want to find out, like, I'm not alone, you know? No, nah, so, you're not alone, man. Because I don't know anybody that did, as, aside from the people that I met in, in jail that, like, you know, sold drugs or killed somebody. Oh, I interviewed Tommy Chong. He went to prison. Oh, okay. Yeah, Well, I mean, counts. I used to know David Crosby. He went to prison. Tim Allen did five years in Texas. Yeah, he did. You know, with the internet, you can look anybody up. But back when he got uh, home improvement... They didn't know that he had done five years in a te prison in Texas for drug trafficking. You think they would ever? And when it, about like a year into the show, it's a hit, and then of course it comes out. And then so what do they do? They have to defend them. They, they go, oh no, he's past that. He paid his dues because it's mm -hmm. like a number two show. I think if it was like the number thirty-two, they probably ah, let's cancel it. Exactly. I remember uh, sometime during the run of Home Improvement. Tim Allen had the number one TV show on television, the number one movie. 
think it might have been the Santa Claus. Santa Claus, sure. right. But then he also had the number one book. Like all at the same time, he had the number one TV, movie, and book. And I was just right. like, that is a am- turns out dude's a felon. <laughs> Uh, but a major like he was like uh, yeah like he was, he was of ki- around. kilos of coke it wasn't like it's crazy was, you know i still keep in touch with the, the cops that worked in the jail uh and one of the judges the judge said to me you got yourself in t- some trouble but you're not like he, he thought it was kind of overblown but you know i'm not minimizing anything i did sure i'm facebook friends with some of the cops that work there they got a kick out of me i think I think that's hilarious. Oh, and I interviewed a guy who was a bank robber. Oh, well, he tops me. Wow. A real bank robber. Yeah, he is a real bank robber. His name is Richard Stanley. He, well, he's, he was very careful to word it. He was convicted of robbing 13 banks. That's how many they got him on. Right. <laughs> he won't say how many he really did rob, but they got him for 13. And it was wow. in California. That guy was in prison for a while. Yeah. My thing, when you said second degree commercial burglary, if you Google that, that means you went into the business. You didn't right. actually, you didn't break into a business. I asked when I went in and cashed the check. That's considered commercial burglary because I'm, I frauded a, a bank. I went into a bank, gave a, they cashed the check. And or I deposited the check, whatever it was. That's why it's first degree would be if you showed up probably with a gun or you broke through a window. But if you read that and you don't know that, like if I would rather it just say check forgery. Exactly. You know, passing bad check. But it sounds like I had like tools and I I came on a helicopter like uh, like men in black. Yeah. You know, and was suspended over the alarm system to not hit the lasers. Mission Impossible style, yeah. It is a very uh, damaging, embarrassing thing. All right, Stephen. I'm going to let you go this time. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, buddy. You, you have it. a great day. You too. All right. Bye-bye. See you later. Opening music is the song FSP theme, written, performed, and provided by Ambush Vin. Closing music is from the song Say My Name off the 2021 album Underdog Anthems, used with permission from Jax Hollow. If you like the show, tell a friend. Subscribe and rate and review the show on iTunes and wherever else you download podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. All the episodes are available there as well. Check me out on Vero at Fascination Street Pod and TikTok at Fascination Street Pod. And again, thanks for listening.